live and then we're just going to do it if that's okay okay do i look pretty beautiful we are live for our mini chautauqua tonight uh, it's so good to have everyone here. There's a hundred people waiting to come on the YouTube tonight, which is awesome. Hello to everyone. Hello, Jason and Javier and Grant and everyone else who's tuned in. And of course, our special guest for the evening, none other than the author of The Simple Path to Wealth, Mr. J.L. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Donegan. Thank you, Mrs. Donegan. It's a, <laughs> a pleasure to be here and, and thanks for uh, putting this together. It's so good to have you here, and we wanted to share some of the energy and the connection that Chautauqua brings through this YouTube Live, and it's, it's not quite the same as being in person, but at oh, least we can yeah. have that chat and answer those questions and connect. Yeah. And there is some special reasons why we're doing tonight, which we'll come on to, so stay tuned. We have some big announcements for you tonight. Uh, but just to now, the simple path to wealth... Like, if you could summarize the simple path to wealth for us, JL, like, what's the overview of the simple path to wealth that you teach? Well, so there, it's there. Basically, there are three three points, if you will: uh, avoid debt, live on on less than you earn, and invest the uh, the difference. And of course, the way I recommend investing is in broad based, low cost index funds. I am uh, specifically partial to uh, total stock market index funds, and, and uh, I'm partial to Vanguard, and so BTSAX is the, the total stock market index fund that you hear me uh, talk about most often. And I will anticipate a question that's going to come out. Yes, VTI, the ETF version, is fine. It is <laughs> the same portfolio as VTSAX. So no worries if you want to own it in VTI. So that brings us perfectly on to the, the first question, which is from Charlene, it says, Mr. Collins, very hey, formal, hey. very formal, Mr. Collins. Very respectful. You know, you could learn from Charlene. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Donnegan. You could respectful. pick up some tips here. I, I like Charlene already. Yeah, me too. Would you recommend VTI for most investors, even in these times of inflation? So again, with the understanding that VTI and VTS VTSAX are the same thing? The answer to that question is yes. Uh, inflation is, is a particularly uh, pernicious uh, uh, thing in the, uh, in the economic world. And, and we really haven't experienced it for 40 plus years. You know, it occurred to me, I'm an old guy and I lived through the 70s, the stagflation of the 70s. But it occurred to me most adults today don't have any experience with inflation and uh, it is ugly. There's no question about it. For instance, uh, as everybody has probably noticed, if you own VBTLX, which is the total bond market fund, well, that's also gone down this year. Now, it hasn't gone down as much as VTSAX, but in a more perfect world, we would hope that it would stay stable or even go up a little bit while stocks are going down. So inflation is very difficult for everything. The good news is that as inflation kind of makes its way through the economy and shakes things out, uh, stocks, which of course are pieces of actual business, businesses are actually a very good inflation hedge. And so they should do fine going forward. And even the bonds, which are getting crushed as the, as the Fed is raising interest rates to combat inflation, even if you own a broad-based bond fund like BBTLX, or I think it's BVI is the ETF version, but if you own that over time, it, it, it owns thousands of bonds and of all different maturities, and there are always some of those bonds uh, coming to maturity at any given point. And of course, the money then is reinvested in new bonds that are paying these high, higher interest rates. So slowly but surely, your bond fund will recover and you will see it's, it will be providing you a, a higher uh, level of interest payments as it does. So yes, absolutely. The advice is still say, the same, stay the course. Uh, there is no better path you could be on uh, even though it's it's a rocky, uh, hilly, difficult journey at this particular stage. 
It's been fascinating. We're currently in Argentina in Buenos Aires and inflation here has been 65% so far this year. Uh, they have like verging on hyperinflation. Um, right. Like out of all, you said him inflation hedges, which means things that like counteract inflation, does it? Like what are the best inflation hedges? Or are there any others? Well, so inflation is is when the cost of goods and services rise. So one of the reasons the stocks is, the stocks are a good inflation hedge is you have to understand that that stocks are just not traded uh, pieces of paper or in this day and age uh, bits on a computer screen. They are certainly that. That's the world of traders. That in my somewhat infamous analogy of a of a of a glass of beer. That's the foam in the beer, but we're investing long-term, which is the beer itself. The beer itself are actual operating companies and they have pricing power and they have assets and they have products and all of those things ratchet up in price with, inf with inflation uh, along with everything else. Um, a lot of the things is not so much what's a good inflation hedge is some of the things that are not so good that people think of like gold is, has never been a particularly good inflation hedge, even though that's something that's thrown out there a lot. Cryptocurrencies, which a lot of people thought had the potential of being a great inflation hedge, you know, they've gotten crushed in this environment. Uh, real estate tends to go up uh, with inflation, although with rising interest rates, up go mortgage rates, down goes demand. So again, just like we talked about with stocks and bonds, short term, it's it can be a very, very rocky road. Um, but you mentioned Argentina and 65% inflation. Inflation, if it gets out of control, if it goes into hyperinflation, uh, that's something that, that does end the game. I mean, that does destroy economies. And that's why it's so important that uh, uh, in the case of the United States, that the that the Fed stay on top of it. And even though it's difficult and will probably trigger a recession, it's critical in my view that they, they raise interest rates and pretty aggressively. In fact, it's my personal view they should have been doing this a year ago. Uh, but a year ago, they were pretending that inflation wasn't going to happen. So there you go. <laughs> they didn't come to you, JL, and ask you for your advice. When they are you going to like, take over the Fed? They did, they, did, they did come to me and ask for my advice. They just didn't follow it. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody came and asked for my advice. <laughs> and to answer your question, Alan, when am I going to take over the Fed? No time soon. No time soon. No so, time soon. Just on while we're talking about inflation, Sage Sam says the stock market beats inflation. However, if you just for money supply, M2, the stock market loses to that inflation. Is that a concern for us? Is there a possible hedge or solution to that? So I'm not I, 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 I didn't quite catch all of that, uh, Katie. Uh, he said or Sage Sam said, um, yes, the stock market beats inflation. But if you adjust for money supply, brackets M2, I don't know what that means, um, the stock market loses to that inflation. Is that a concern for us? And are there any possible hedges or solutions to that? Well, I'm not aware of, of, of uh, M, the M2 money supply uh, causing stocks to lag inflation. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we have uh, one of the... the key factors, maybe the single, uh, uh, the, the single most salient factor behind inflation, in, in my view, is the enormous amount of money we've pumped into the system. And so I'm not quite following what he's saying, but, but certainly when you pump an enormous amount of money into the system, you devalue the currency, which is what inflation is. And then it takes more dollars to buy any, any given thing. Uh, so the purchasing power of your money is less than than uh, it was a day earlier, and and uh, you know a year earlier, and a decade earlier. But but uh, you know you have to look at what your options are. And to answer the second part of his question, uh, I'm not aware of a better path. You know, this is sometimes you just have to have to 
have to walk across the, the jagged stones. Yeah, it sounds like weathering the storm, especially because there's been uh, murmurings of the fact that we're actually entering a bear market at the moment. Does the fact we're in a bear market change anything? No, and in fact, I'm kind of surprised it took us this long to get uh, into a bear market. We, uh, I think we crossed that, that Rubicon on last Friday, and it, it, it was a long kind of painful drift down. I saw some t statistic, and I don't remember well enough to quote it, but that the number of weeks that have been uh, negative over the last few months is some sort of record or close to it. But bear markets are perfectly normal things. Uh, this is not something that is is unusual. I mean, bear, I, I, I preach uh, as part of my investing philosophy that the market is volatile and bear markets and even things much more serious, you know, bear market is defined as being 20% down. And I think we're now like 22% or something down. So we are in bear market territory, perfectly natural. Um, they happen on a regular basis. Corrections, which are defined as being 10% down happen more frequently. And then, you know, there are crashes, which in my mind are when you get into 30 plus 30, 35 plus percent, those are also a natural part of the process. Fortunately, they are rarer, but if you're going to invest in stocks, you have to understand that these things are going to happen. And it's exceedingly difficult to predict when they're going to happen. People have been predicting this bear market for the last 20 years. So here, here so they're finally right, you know. <laughs> Uh, but that's why I say you can't, you can't predict it. You just have to endure it. You have to tie yourself to the mast, stay the course. Uh, hopefully, if you're working and you're putting money in, you know, you're saving, uh, as we talked about at the very beginning of the conversation, you're saving um, a portion of everything you earn. You're living on less than you earn. Well, this is a golden opportunity to acquire shares at a bargain price. So if you're in the wealth accumulation stage, Bear markets, market declines in general, are an absolute gift. I mean, you're buying these on sale as long as you don't panic and sell. Now, if you sell when the market goes down, and I've said this many times before, you don't want to follow my advice. My advice will leave you bleeding on the side of the road if you're not going to stay the course. So the first thing you ought to sort out in your mind before you consider following the simple path to wealth is am I going to stay the course when the market drops? And right now we have a litmus test. If you know what's going on now is about to drive you from the market, then you should not have been in the market to begin with. It would have been helpful for you to have known that before this happened, but, but better late than never, I guess. Uh, so I'm almost imagining your answer as I asked this question from Charlene. Uh, do you think the market has bottomed? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so you're imagining my answer. Let's say I, 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 uh, what, what would you what would you suspect I'm going to say, Alan? I'll bet I bet you do know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you say, well, like no one knows, like you cannot know whether it's at the bottom and there will be people that's predicting it's going to fall a lot further. There'll be people predicting it's going to go up and someone will be right. Okay, folks, I'm going to go take a nap. Alan will do all the rest of these questions. <laughs> you are such like a young mentee, aren't you? It's like, because clearly, you know, clearly he, he knows what I'm, I'm going to say. That's yeah, absolutely I'm right. Dad I mean, at this moment. What was that Katie? You can be a proud fatherly moment at this point. That your your young prodigy is your young partner. I, I could pass the baton. Uh, no, that's uh, I, I I could not have said it better myself. And Charlene, I have no clue as to whether this is the bottom of of the of the market or not. I have and and nobody does. I mean that that that's not to say there aren't countless people. Uh, expressing opinions as to whether this is the bottom, whether it's going to go further, how much further down it's going to be, when it's going to turn around. And of course, that's all nonsense. Nobody, nobody actually knows, which is why my fundamental take on this is you just stay the course. And frankly, you enjoy it while it lasts. And by that, I mean, you are investing new money 
or as I did uh, yesterday, actually, you're shifting some of your bond money into stocks. So I was waiting for it to cross that 20%, not because I thought that was the bottom, I don't know, but I thought, wow, if I can pick up stocks at a 20% discount, I'm going to shift, even though my bonds have also lost, but they've lost half as much. So I'm going <laughs> to shift some, I'm going to shift some money uh, from my bonds and in, uh, into stocks. And then if the market continues to go down, uh, you know, I'll probably shift some more it's at maybe 25 or 30% or whatever it goes down. So I, the fact the market is going down doesn't bother me even a little bit. And I'm an old guy. I mean, if, you know, if, if particularly if I were young and, and uh, investing every month out of my earned income, I, I would be celebrating this. The best possible thing that can happen to somebody who is, uh, especially at the early stages of accumulating wealth, is a, is a nice big market crash that brings all the prices down during their, their buying years. So, yeah. I love that. But, so but no, I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. No idea. Um, so we've got a, a question from ST, which I think is in the middle of both of those points you've just mentioned. And the question from ST is, if a recession is triggered, how do we hedge or ride that out? And the reason he asks is at the beginning of 2022, uh, they were one year from firing. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're not so sure because their numbers have gone. So I think that's like they're at that point where they're getting close to retiring and this has affected their thinking. So if a recession is triggered, how do we hedge or ride that out? Well, so I, I'm not sure if he's asking if a recession is triggered or, or if this decline in, in his assets, which, of course, is already in the process of happening. Um, I'm not sure how you ride out a recession. I mean, you hope if you are working, obviously, you hope that you're one of the people who keeps their job because one of the hallmarks of, of recessions is, is uh, uh, job loss. Now, so far in the US, you know, there we have a labor shortage. So uh, that seems not to be an issue now. But on the other hand, we're not really in a recession yet, at least uh, not so far as I know. They, they of course, uh, recessions are defined as a declining quarter, and they don't know that until after the fact. But probably uh, there is a recession coming, and it's probably later this year or early, early next year. But if he's still working, and if he was uh, close to firing, and, and so there's two things. Uh, firing meaning that he has enough money to be financially independent. And then the next step is actually t is stepping away from, from his job. Um, it might not be a bad idea to keep that job for a while and to take advantage of these lower prices and, and buy more shares with that earned income. I would, I would probably do that. Now, on the other hand, uh, if, if he's in a soul crushing job and, and can't stand it, then that's a, that's a different equation. Um, but, but not knowing that if his job is okay, or particularly if he kind of likes it, you know, I, I, I'd stay until until the economy started going back up just to take advantage of these lower prices. I love that. I love that. Um, Matt asked a question. Uh, JL, what do you say to Michael Burry, who says we're in an index fund bubble? And I just Googled Michael Burry to make sure we're talking about the same person. He's an American investor, hedge fund manager, which probably tells you what you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> and physician. He founded the hedge fund Scion Capital, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he says we're in an index fund bubble. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think he also wrote a book about the, the, the last, uh, uh, you know, the 2008, 2009. So I kind of vaguely know who he is. Um, so the argument, as I understand it, for people that are afraid that, that we're in an index bubble is that it is the process of the buying and selling of individual stocks between uh, individuals or, or between uh, investment firms in, in say actively managed mutual funds. It is that process and the analysis that those organizations and those individuals go through that determine at any given time what, 
what is the true value of a company? What's the true value of a stock? And of course, the idea of indexing is that you just buy everything in the, in the index without worrying about whether they're priced fairly or too high or too low or, or what have you. So that's the basic argument that if everybody's indexing, how, is, how are the prices going to be set in some uh, rational way? And um, my response to that is, I, I think indexing, while it has grown dramatically, is far from taking over the universe in a way that would interfere with that process. Um, but Jack Bogle, before he died, fielded this question. Jack Bogle, of course, being the creator of index funds and the founder of Vanguard. Uh, and he made a very astute observation. He's, he said, you know, when, they, when he looked back at his early career, long before uh, index funds were invented, so we're talking about in the 50s, 60s, uh, early 70s, uh, when buying individual stocks was almost the only game in town. There were a few mutual funds out there, but they were all actively managed mutual funds. He looks back in those days and he says, you know, the volume of trading that was done in those days that everybody, nobody had this question about whether you were successfully setting values for stocks. The volume of trades that were done in those days is a fraction of the volume of actively traded stocks going on today. So this is a non-issue. My uh, cynical side says that people that run actively managed funds or hedge funds or what have you, have a vested interest in trying to divert people from, uh, from index funds. Uh, so that's, yeah. my, that's my cynical view, but it's not something that I lose any sleep over. Well, I just had a pop at one of the actively managed funds uh, in the UK that were charging four times what you would pay if you invest in a Vanguard index fund and you got like 50% of the performance because it was an actively managed fund. Right. It did not perform as well. And they're out there promoting actively managed funds are the way to go. And I think whilst there's money to be made, people will be promoting it because their livelihoods, their livelihoods demand it of course the other the other thing is i you know the other question that comes on the heels of that one is well okay that's today what if index funds keep growing and growing and growing and pretty soon that's that's all there is that's never going to happen because investing in index funds uh and staying the course is is really a little bit counter to human nature there is something in humans that likes that likes to gamble I mean, that's why you have casinos all over the world that, that you know, rake in billions of dollars. Humans love the idea that they can outperform. And people who can sell them on the idea they can outperform make a ton of money. So that is net siren song is never going to go away. There's always going to be probably more people that are, are, are inclined to believe it and be lured into it than there are people to, to who are going to listen to me and and go into a boring index fund. I, I hear all the time, you know, things like, yeah, yeah, index funds are okay, but it's kind of boring. And I, I it makes me want to tear my hair out. It's <laughs> investing your money should not be how you seek entertainment. I don't expect my money to entertain me. I expect my money to make money for me. I'll, I'll go find other ways to entertain myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but there are a lot of people that, that, you know, want to, and I, and I, you know, I'm a little flippant here, but I had the stock picking disease for a long, it took me a long time to embrace indexing myself. And I know from experience, there are a few things in life that are more intoxicating than finding a company, uh, researching it, buying it, and turning out to be right and watching it go up. I mean, that is a very seductive feeling. And it, it you know, you, you have the tendency to focus on those that work and somehow you kind of forget those that didn't. <laughs> and that, that makes a lot of people think they perform better than they actually, than they actually do. So, was... yeah. Yeah, active manage, uh, actively picking stocks and actively managed mutual funds are going to be around for a long time. Uh, 
I'm sure there are, if there are any active managers out there listening to this, they're probably, you know, kind of sipping their whiskey and nodding their head and saying, yeah, sure, JL, you know, <laughs> you, you go, but, but my monthly income is probably more than your net worth. And they're probably right. Their monthly income is probably more than my net worth. Uh, so let's have one more question before we move on to the big announcement about well, with the big oh, announcement. Don't, don't give it away, Alan. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait to hear what it is myself. <laughs> um, very quick one from Brian Wolf, which probably we're in a place to answer as well, is can you speak to foreigners' ability to invest in VTI and VTSAX? Um, like very dealing with that very quickly. In the UK, there is a Vanguard arm and you can invest through different organisations or directly through Vanguard in those. I know it's available in parts of Europe. Uh, we started to find places in Colombia and Mexico, and some of the new platforms are allowing investors to invest in those funds in the States. So it's starting to become more prevalent. There is normally a financial independence community in each country that you should tap into and start to find out whether you can find those. So that's a quick answer to that one. Going back to the person who's a lot more interesting than I am. Um, the question is, do you think your strategy still works? Like does the simple path to work, simple path to wealth, is it standing the test of time? Does it still work? It was, we kind of addressed this a little bit earlier with a, as an offshoot to a different question, but yes, absolutely. It's interesting to me, I, you know, I started writing the blog in 2011. Of course, I developed this approach that I that I talk about that I use myself over the decades before that. Uh, but ever since I went public, and then the book came out in 2016. So whenever, ever since I've gone public with it, whenever the market has a hiccup, I get this question. <laughs> I, and it's it's and I have said many, many times, it doesn't matter what, you know, again, drops in the market are perfectly normal. You absolutely have to expect them. The only thing that changes is the trigger, right? So when COVID hit in the spring of 2020, my Twitter and Facebook accounts lit up with people saying, you know what, JL, this time it's different. This time, this time it's, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> this time people are dying. This time, you know, you have to admit that, that your approach is not going to work anymore. Well, no, I admitted no such thing. My response to that is, yes, it's tragic that people are dying. It's tragic that the reason that the market went into that particular crash is because of a pandemic that's killing people. But that doesn't change the investment philosophy. That doesn't change the fact that this is just happens to be the trigger this time. And of course, I, to be clear, I had no idea this was going to happen. But never has a crash reversed itself in history faster than that one. Yes. So not only were these people claiming that my approach was ready for the trash bin of history, I mean, it was, it was a stunning reversal. So no, the, my approach is as long as the United States is a capitalist country uh, with a vibrant uh, stock market, then and I foresee that for the indefinite future, then this is going to be an approach that, that works. Um, for the approach to stop working, it, it would really mean the end of the United States, or at least the end of the United States in any, any form that we know of, uh, that we've known it in, in politically and economically. Uh, and of course, that could happen. Probably at some point in history, it will happen. But I don't think it's uh, happening in my lifetime and probably not in my daughter's lifetime. So let's move on to uh, your big announcement, which you've put out on your blog, you've shared with the world. Um, you've got a follow up book to The Simple Path to Wealth coming out soon, and you want people to be involved. I do. I do. It's, it is a, uh, there's kind of an interesting history here. I, uh, 
uh, as I was finishing up my second book, which is how I lost money in real estate before it was fashionable, which of course had nothing to do with the simple path to wealth, an entirely different kind of project. It's the antithesis. Um, it's the complex path to wealth. Yeah, right, right. Or, the, or in that case, the, the complex path to poverty. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that book, if anybody's interested, is, is a lesson on, on what not to do when you're investing in real estate. And it's, it's very short. It's amusingly illustrated. It was a lot of fun to do. But anyway, as I was loved reading it, uh, as I was putting the finishing touches on that book last fall, uh, I got an email from uh, a woman by the name of Sally with Harriman House, which is a UK publisher. And uh, in the spring, I had put up a, a post asking for help with that second book, uh, proofreaders and designers and that kind of thing. Uh, because I was self-publishing it. And uh, Sally sent this email and, and said, uh, you know, we'd love to help you with, with this book that you're working on. And I uh, emailed her back and I said, well, I appreciate that. But the fact is that, you know, I'm a week away from publishing it. So this, it's, it's kind of done. But I do have uh, an idea for a third book. Uh, that would be a follow-up to the simple path to wealth. And I'm thinking that would be based on the case studies that I've already done on the blog. And uh, she said, wow, we love that idea. And she introduced me to the fellow who's now my editor, uh, Chris. We talked about this over the course of six months and finally uh, came up with the idea of what we wanted to do. Herman House, by the way, is the same publisher that did uh, Morgan Housel's book, uh, The Psychology of Money. And I, wow. think, I think Morgan's book, The Psychology of Money, is a brilliant book. Uh, I, you know, I think it's a great companion to my own, The Simple Path to Wealth, a you know, different way to, to look at things. So I love that book, and it's been phenomenally successful. And these are the guys who did it. So when they reached out, I, I, already, you know, I already had a favorable impression, and I called Morgan and chatted with him about them, and he gave them multiple, you know, big thumbs up and that's great to work with. And that's my experience. And then they came up with some, some cool ideas, including, well, rather than just look at the case studies that have already been done, let's reach out to your readers and, and do many more smaller vignettes about how people uh, have taken the simple path to wealth and adapted it to their unique situations. And that's fascinating to me because ever since I published it, I've been hearing those stories. And I wrote kind of famously, if anybody follows me, they probably already heard me say this. I created the blog to archive this information for my daughter. I wrote the book for my daughter. My daughter was in college at the time. She, so she was at the very beginning of her journey. And in a sense, the book works best for somebody who's at the very beginning, but most readers are not. Most readers yeah. are further along in their journey. Most readers look at it and they say, you know, this makes a lot of sense and I want to I wanna get on this simple path, but I have things to unwind. Maybe I have a lifestyle that's, that's more extravagant than I should have let it get. Maybe I have investments that, that were the wrong kinds of things. And I have been amazed at how creative people have been in taking my basic concepts and adapting it to their unique situation, including my international audience, which is really amazing to me because my book is, yeah, there you are. My book is very <laughs> US centric, as you will attest to. So I talk about, you know, US things like 401ks and IRAs and and to my amazement, my, you know, a lot of those things in some form exist in other countries. And my readers, and this really shouldn't amaze me, are astute enough to say, oh, IRA 401, oh, that's what it is. In our, and so I've gotten a lot of messages from international readers on how they adapt it to their own, to their own countries and their offering in their countries and how people on different stages of the journey and I think that that's probably something a lot of people would be interested in hearing about, because I imagine a lot of people read the book and say, wow, this sounds great. I'd really like to do it. But, you know, I'm 50 years old or I'm 45 or I'm 40 or I'm 55 or I'm 
29 and, and you know how do i how do i get off the path that i'm on and and uh and there are lots of very creative ways people have done that so we are reaching out to to my readers asking them to to share their stories and we'll we'll put together categories the stories that illustrate things like getting out of debt or changing the investments you're you're in, or adapting it to a different country than the United States, and we'll and we'll probably adapt those categories depending on the kinds of stories that that people feed back to us. And uh, and I also I tell people don't worry if you don't think you're a writer. We have editors at Harriman that will that will polish that up. So no no worries. On, on that. <laughs> And I'm I'm excited about it because I think it's going to be a brilliant follow up to the Simple Path to Wealth, but I'm also excited to read the stories myself, you know. And then uh, and then I'll put together as we create these categories, I'll I'll put together introductions and talk talk about the principles that the stories that we've created. And then the final thing that Harriman has suggested, and I think we're going to do, uh, because again, providing this information for my daughter is the has been the cornerstone of all the work I've done. Um, Harriman wants to interview uh, Jessica and myself, and uh, and transcribe that interview into into the book. So that should be kind of a kind of a fun part of it as well. I love that. So, can anyone listening to this right now, like, share stories and ideas? Can they? Oh. Can Absolutely. Not only can they, but I'm, I'm hoping they will. I think, you know, we, we would, we would welcome that. Uh, and I think you're going to have a link in this as to uh, where they can go and, and uh, express their interest. Uh, Harriman has created a, uh, uh, a particular web page to, to collect all of uh, uh, initially all of the people express an interest and then we'll reach out to them and, and uh, so, yeah, if anybody is, is interested in sharing their story, start thinking about your story. Try to keep it fairly concise. Try to focus on maybe one aspect of it, um, not an entire life story. You know, you'll have a better chance of being included. But, yeah, you know, and, and uh, something that, that you took out of it. And, and uh, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Katie has just shared the link in the comments put, or it's in the description as well. I've put two yeah. links in there. There's one to the post that JL did on his blog announcing his new book project and then one directly to that Harriman link that JL mentioned where you can directly put your details in and sign up. So yeah, please. People, I thank you for putting the link to the post because that uh, if people are interested in participating in this, if they go to the post they can hear maybe a, a better organized, more coherent description <laughs> from me as to what we're actually doing. And, and there'll be links to, to join in the fun and, and be part of the project. And of course, you know, we'll, we'll uh, credit people that, that, uh, uh, that are, are part of it. So. If you're yeah. catching up on this and not listening live, the link to JL's post is in the description of the video. So just click on the link right now, fill out your details, and then they'll come back to you with more information about how to be involved in the new book, which is super exciting for us because ever since we read The Simple Path to Wealth, we have been on The Simple Path to Wealth uh, and trying to get off the complex uh, route to poverty. <laughs> We're still trying to sell our properties right about poverty. now. Um, well, anyway, know, and that's that's actually an important. Uh, you are you you guys are actually great uh, uh, great uh, examples of this of this process because I remember when you first came to Chautauqua and we did our one on one session and you know you were uh, you were not at the beginning of your journey and 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 it has been I I, I think you would agree or I think I I'm understanding it correctly it's. It wasn't, you know, it's not something that happens overnight. It's a, it's a process that you have to figure out step by step. And especially if you're, you know, you're unwinding some, uh, some other investments and, and uh, what have you. So, yeah, you guys are, are sort of ex exactly the, the uh, poster children for, <laughs> for uh, this kind of process, you know, and to, un not only uh, unwinding the investments, but adapting it to your home country and 
Yeah. So yeah, we had to translate four hundred one k to pension, and we had to translate right. broth to right. ISA and all those different elements. And like we've had the properties on the market for two years now. Um, right. We finally got an offer update it's perfect so uh fingers crossed but anyway back to the questions enough Just, about us uh, trying to get our property quick one a few people have said make sure you check your spam when you sign up with harriman the confirmation email might go to spam so just go and check that ah, that's a great point that's a great point i love that thank you katie uh we did have one question which would said why is the chautauqua logo an earth upside down well, that, you know, so first of all, I, I'm horrified that that's a question because <laughs> I, 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 w- I would hope that people would look at it and say, oh, yeah. Uh, but the, the, uh, uh, the uh, there's a couple of reasons for it, at least for me, it was, it was my creation. So my thinking behind, behind it, <clears throat> excuse me, bear with me. A sip of water. We'll take a break mid questions. Okay, so my thinking behind it is first of all, the earth is not upside down because the earth doesn't have a top and the bottom. If you were uh, an alien flying here in your spaceship, uh, as you're arriving to earth, what part of the planet would be up and what part of the planet would be down from your perspective would be entirely dependent on the direction from which you were coming. So the planet is not upside down. It's just because we are used to seeing it with the North Pole at the top and the South Pole at the bottom that it appears to be upside down from our perspective. But there is nothing inherent in the planet that has an up or down to it. So that's point number one. Point number two is the whole approach to the simple path to wealth turns the investing community upside down. So it's a it's an entirely different way of looking at investing. Not so different now after ten years. Uh, certainly not different in this community. It's uh, become a little bit of gospel. But when I first brought it out there, it was entire. This this approach was entirely different, and still gets some pretty harsh uh, pushback. And as I said earlier, I don't anticipate that everybody or even most people are ever going to follow this path. Most people will continue to be stock breakers and what have you. So it's a different way of looking at things. It's turning conventional ideas on their head and saying, oh, let's look at them when they're upside. Oh, and you know what? That's not really upside down. That's just a different perspective. So that's my thinking behind it. And Chautauqua is a very different event. I always love running with you. It's so much fun. Um, look- oh, and you, you, you and a uh, little shout out to Alan and Katie here. Uh, Alan and Katie have been running Chautauqua since 2017, and you guys do a brilliant job, an absolute brilliant job. I mean, you pick the coolest places. Uh, everything goes smooth as clockwork, uh, you know, the excursions, and and all I need to do is hang out and have fun with the people who show up. It's 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 a it's a brilliant brilliant approach from my point of view but thank you, <laughs> you guy i you 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 have made my life so much better and you made chautauqua so much better so oh, thank uh, you thank you the simple big, path big, of chautauqua big, big heartfelt kudos thank you so much we Thanks, really Jay. appreciate that yeah. um so like a question about on the journey to fire and then we've got a couple of questions from sarah alicia and different people about getting there the question from Elva is, what were some of your biggest challenges when pursuing fire and how did you overcome them? So Elva, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question for me uh, because you have to understand uh, uh, my, my time frame. I never pursued fire. Uh, I, I never heard the term financial independence or uh, retire early uh, until after I started writing my blog. So when I began my journey, which really started in the mid seventies when I graduated from college, um, I was doing this by instinct. This is just what felt right to me. But I was wandering in the wilderness. 
there was, of course, no internet in those days. There were no personal computers in those days. I, I knew no one else who thought the way I did, not a single person. I was very much the odd one out. I, and, and, and I frequently had misgivings. I, on, on how can, you know, I, how, how can everybody else, I mean, what am I doing here? But, but it just, it, it just is something that it felt right to me. Now, that was not index investing yet. That was the part about avoiding debt and living below my means and investing the difference. And as I think I alluded to earlier, I was a stock picker initially. Uh, and I, in fact, I, my dirty little secret in a sense is that I achieved financial independence picking individual stocks. Uh, and I, I hit financial independence. Yeah, right. I know. Uh, the secret's out. Uh, <laughs> I hit financial independence in 1989, but I didn't know that, that I had. Yeah. So in 1989, I, I quit a job. My, my career, which I enjoyed, it was in the magazine publishing business, but I didn't like doing it all the time. So every now and again, I'd quit and step away. And the longest gap in my career was from 89, 90 to 95. And about midway through that, um, my daughter was born. Uh, my wife went back to school. She wasn't, so she also wasn't working and I wasn't working. We didn't have any income. And as I did every year in those days with a paper and pen, because again, uh, before computers. Wait, what's, that? These, what's that, Jay? What is paper and pen? <laughs> That's this <laughs> and this. I know you've probably never seen them before, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure you can find a museum. I only and, use my thumbs yeah. for this. Have you got a calculator as well? That you yeah, like that's not down. how you you don't use your thumbs with these. Anyway, I I would at the end of each year I would I would uh, total up all of our investments, right? And about three years into this this uh, this uh, sabbatical, I guess you'd call it, I was taking. I noticed that you know. We've led the same life we have always led. We live in the same house. We we didn't cut anything back in particular. Now, to be clear, we we're, we've never been extravagant people, but we have a new baby. We have you know, and at the end of the year, we had more money than we started with. And then I went back and I looked at the year before, and I said, you know, that was true last year. We had more money at the end of the year than we start with. And I went back and I looked at the first year, and that was true then. And, and now this is really embarrassing to admit, I was smart enough to know, to recognize that something remarkable had happened. <laughs> but, but I was not smart enough to put two and two together and realize that, oh, this means I have enough money that I never have to work again. Now, part of that was I enjoyed my career and, and I've never had uh, uh, retiring early, so to speak, as, as a goal, but but I just sort of looked at it and I said, wow, this is really interesting. And then I put my paper and pen and notes away and went on with my life. <laughs> but, uh, so it wasn't until I started writing the blog about the investment approach that, I, that I've taken that I came across the concept of financial independence and retiring early and what have you, which I think is a, is a brilliant concept. And I am more than a little envious of uh, people today that that have, well, like my new book, Pathfinders, you know, that have access to a book like The Simple Path to Wealth, like The Psychology of Money, uh, like Quit Like a Millionaire that uh, Christy and, and Bryce put together, uh, that, that lay out these paths. And then this new book uh, is called Pathfinders. So in about a year, uh, you know, I'm gonna have a book out there with, the stories of lots of people who who have you know that are providing guideposts uh, on the way. That's a that's an amazing advantage that people have today. You know, we and, are hugely grateful. We are hugely and grateful, and I am comments. hugely envious. <laughs> <laughs> there's been lots of comments of very grateful people in the chat as well. I'm curious, JL, do you still have those uh, pieces of paper? With the, with the numbers. Yeah, on. do you still have the numbers? They, yeah. You know, I, I, I actually, um, I don't know how far back it goes, but I, I do have it on a spreadsheet now. 
and uh, uh, that I create. So I, at some point, I transferred the the early pieces of paper into this spreadsheet, and I think the spreadsheet probably goes back to 88, 89, somewhere in there. So it doesn't go all the way back, which is too bad. I thought you were uh, going to say it went onto punch cards as the interim step. No, no, I, I never did, <laughs> never did, the, never did, the, never did the punch card thing. So yeah, I probably created the probably didn't create the spreadsheet until the mid '90s. Uh, you know, I was probably around the time that I I learned how to how to navigate spreadsheets. So I, I at that point I I'm sure I transcribed the the notes that I had, but the actual pieces of paper are in a museum somewhere. <laughs> in the, in the Collins Family Museum. Uh, yeah, it is fascinating. Our spreadsheet goes back to 2015, so we've got seven years of data, and you can see the J curve of compounding take effect, and it's really interesting when you track it over the years. Well, you know what's really interesting, because I, I, mine now expands decades, is you can also see when the market plunges, I can see, I can see the plunges in my net worth, right? And so I can see my net worth growing, 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 and then suddenly it'll plunge and maybe it'll go down for a couple of years, you know, kind of drift down. And then inevitably it goes back and, and goes past the previous peak and goes up and up and up. And then, you know, the market, as, as I say many times already in this conversation, the, you know, these market drops are perfectly normal part of the process. They have happened many times in my investing life and they will happen many times in the investing lives of everybody listening and it and none of it matters as long as you stay the course it just now I look at it and it's that's well, it's kind of interesting that was a that was a tough stretch of two three years right there and wow that was a great year that you know and so yeah that's fun to it's it's I would recommend doing it because it is fun to look back at it uh, yeah, we do a monthly finance meeting where we sit down and do a quick wealth, like a net worth snapshot, put yeah. the figures in, and then you can sort of watch the graph go. Uh, we're geeky. We actually like one of the highlights of the month. Nice breakfast finance meeting. The highlight of the, the month. The highlight, sorry, yeah. the highlight of the month. Um, but going back to the questions, uh, Sarah, Sarah Grafton, I believe she came on the UK, Chautauqua. Uh, hello, Sarah. She said... Um, I found my dedication to and prioritization of work helped on our road to FI. Now that we've reached FI, I question my draw to continue with full-time work. What advice do you have for re-evaluating work when someone reaches FI, coast FI, gets there or thereabouts with the number? Right. So I, as I, as I said a few moments ago, for me, and I actually wrote a guest post for Mr. Money Mustache back in like 2012. He asked me to write this. And the title of that, uh, that guest post was, It's Never Been About Retirement. Mm. So for me, and remembering, I didn't have the, the concept of early retirement. But I, because I enjoyed my work, I just didn't want to do it all the time. So my career... You know, I, I and also that, you know, I, I tend to throw myself into into things with great intensity. And the problem with that is you burn yourself out, or at least I burn myself out. And so then, you know, I go from being the best person they ever hired to not being right. And <laughs> the if, they're not, if they're not smart enough to fire me at that point, I, you know, hopefully I'm smart enough to, to step away. But so I was always taking these these self-created sabbaticals, which, by the way, in those days was not acceptable. No. So I was always trying to figure out inventive ways to fill those holes in my resume. So it's hard for me to say that um, the first time I ever quit a job with the idea of never working again was in 2011. And uh, very coincidentally, that was at the same time I started the blog. I never anticipated that the blog would grow into what it is. I just thought it would be an archive for this information for my daughter. So when I started the blog, I had no idea I'd developed this huge audience. I had no idea it would be international. I had no idea that I'd create a sh thing called Chautauquas. I had no idea that I'd be writing to now a third third book. None of that was, was 
anywhere on my horizon when I quit that job. And I am so grateful and so lucky that those pieces fell into place because it's a lot of work, but it's very satisfying, at least for myself. I find that I enjoy work a lot more than I enjoy play. And I'm a lot better at it, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know that I'm the right person to ask, but I think, I think the reason that, that people are negative about work, at least the reason that, that when I have been negative about work, and trust me, a lot of times in my, my career, I was very negative about work, including in 2011, which is why I quit that job. Um, it's because you don't have the autonomy around it. You don't have the control around it. And maybe it's not something that's really inspiring. Maybe you're just doing it for the money. But in that case, if that's how you feel, then what FI means is not, and I've always hated the acronym, by the way, FIRE. I don't personally use it because I've never liked the retire early piece of it. Um, but FI to me just means you no longer have to work for money. Now that I still earn money doing what I do. And I think that's worth doing, but you, money doesn't have to be part of the equation of what you do for quote unquote work. And you can turn your attention to, to doing uh, uh, things that inspire you and things that are satisfying to you. And those things uh, are going to be work, but, but uh, they're not going to be something that, uh, that you do not want in your life. They're, you know, they're active, positive things in your life, it seems to me. So loss, I apologize for a long rambling answer, but, uh, but there you go. I don't think I've ever met anybody in this community who retired in that sort of the traditional way that we think of where you stop doing anything productive and you spend your yeah, you spend your life on the beach or on, or on the golf course or, you know, whatever. And that's all you do. I just, um, yeah, I don't think I've, I don't think I've met anybody in this community who's, who's done that. No, we, we hit our number about three years ago and we've definitely found that purposeful, meaningful stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, and we don't necessarily earn money doing it. Like yeah. it's, but we have fun and we do things and we create and like having a purpose, I think is awesome. Ryan says that RE should stand for relaxed employment. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I like I, that. I, I, may, I, may have to, I may have to steal that. Relax. <laughs> yeah. Financial independence, relaxed. Employment. <laughs> that's brilliant. He, he, he better copyright it. I think that's really good. And Peter Galland says, uh, we're not built to do nothing. And I think I, I agree completely. You know, and I, I know there was one time in my working career, I actually had a, had a, a fight with a, with a friend of mine about this. I was just, I was in a, in a, what they call a soul crushing job at that point. And I was looking for a way out. And I, I remember saying to Frank was this guy's name, you know, as soon as I'm out of this job, I am never working again. I am going to be, I am going to be sitting on a beach drinking pina coladas and, and that's it. That's the rest of my life. And Frank's like, no, you're not going to do that. They're like, you don't know me. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And, and it turns out Frank was right. <laughs> but I did sit on the proverbial beach for a little while, you know, licking my wounds and recovering. So. Uh, so if it's all right, we're going to go, we're going to change pace slightly. We've had a few like financial and more technical questions on the details. So we've got a few technical questions okay. for you. Um, we'll, we'll break it in easy with Grant. Uh, do you believe the 4% rule is a safe withdrawal rate? Wow, that's a, that's a little bit of a loaded question, Grant. So let me start by saying I, I don't believe in the 4% rule at all. I believe in the 4% guideline. So I think when people started calling it the 4% rule, suddenly there's, there's this enormous volume of debate over whether 4% is the correct uh, withdrawal rate and whether it's working in this environment or last environment. And it, it reminds me of evidently four or 500 years ago, theologians were engaged in serious conversations about 
how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. So I think if you just remove the word rule and you say the 4% guideline, I think it is a brilliant guideline. A couple of things, uh, you can go to uh, the Trinity study and you can find this on my blog in the stock series when I, when I talk, I think I have a post called how much can I withdraw anyway? It's also, I reproduced some of the Trinity study charts in my book. Uh, and you can look at the Trinity study uh, charts and you can see not only how 4% withdrawal rate works over 10, 20, 30 years, but you can see how 5% works, how 2% works, how 10% works. The fundamental thing to understand is that when the financial advisor, I forget his name, uh, first came up with this concept of a 4% withdrawal rate, I want to say in the late 1990s, it was then and is now an extraordinarily conservative number, right? So it was designed to weather severe financial storms. And in the 30-year period that the Trinity study looked at, uh, it, it succeeded in all but two start years, which means it succeeded 96% of the time. And that was adjusting it every year for inflation blindly without even thinking about it. Uh, that's incredible because, you know, th that 30-year period was not some smooth, ideal uh, moment in time. Uh, in fact, I have a, a post on my, my blog, maybe Katie, you can link to this one too, called time machine and the future value of stocks, where I, I talk about how traumatic the 40 years from, from uh, 1975 to, to 2015, which is when I wrote that post, uh, and it represented my investing life, all the traumatic things that happened. Uh, and, the, and the market still returned 12% on average every year. Every year. So the four so the 4% rule is, in my view, very, very conservative. I think it's a great guideline. I think anybody who set their withdrawal rate at 4% and just for inflation every year and put it on autopilot and forgot about it is making a serious error for two reasons. The obvious serious error is that it is possible that you could start your retirement in one of the the few, very few years in which it's not going to work and you're going to run out of money and nobody wants that to happen. So you need to be paying attention. So if suddenly, you know, you run into what's called a, a sequence of return uh, uh, risk where, where when you first start out, the market's down for several years, that's, that's a risky thing. You're going to need to rethink your, the amount you're withdrawing. Maybe you're even going to need to go back to work. So that's the risk everybody thinks about. But here's the other reason you need to pay attention. The vast majority of time, if you set the 4% rule, adjust it for inflation every year, and you put it on autopilot, at the end of 30 years, you're going to wind up with a fortune of unspent Staggering money. Amount. Yeah. Right. So you will have lost the opportunity to enjoy the wealth that your portfolio is throwing off far in excess of your withdrawal rate. So toss out the word rule, substitute the word uh, guideline, and it's brilliant. I love that. I feel like that's the mic drop moment on that. We're going to move pull on. The plug yeah, just the pull event. the plug. Game over. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, Javier says, building on that, Javier says, very interested to know a simple way for intergenerational investment like does this stand up over time how do we think about this over intergenerations yeah i i wrote i also wrote a post about this uh i I'm trying to remember the title i think investing for seven generations that was it so so uh, uh native americans and that's a uh, that's a sweeping statement so probably not all native americans but i uh, there are many uh, Native Americans who have a concept of, of thinking out seven generations. It's usually, it's usually uh, presented in context of how you treat the environment, right? So the idea is that whenever you're thinking about doing something, uh, you should be thinking about what is the impact 
that your action today is going to have seven generations out. And that's, of course, a long way out. There's the famous, you know, there's a famous story of you, you know, old, an old man planting a tree that he's never going to get to sit under, but his grandchildren will sit under. Um, going seven generations out, nobody knows what that kind of future looks like. Uh, but I have said to my daughter, uh, to the extent that I, and I have mixed feelings about this, but if I were to pass on wealth to her, uh, it would be with the understanding that it is not her money. Uh, just like right now, it's not my money. It belongs to future generations. And what she's really inheriting is being the custodian of that money. Uh, she inherit, would inherit the right to enjoy the, uh, uh, the 4%, let's say, that it throws off. But she doesn't have the right to delve into the principal or to spend the principal down. That belongs to her children. And so she has a responsibility to pass that on intact to her children, along with educating them that it's not their money. They are custodians of it and they have the, the, the right to enjoy uh, the 4% that it throws off, but the obligation to educate their children and pass it on. I think that's how you pass on multi-generation. But of course, passing on multi-generational wealth, we can look at history as an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. <laughs> and it does tend to break down over time. And so I think ultimately it's, it's probably... Uh, uh, it's a very elusive goal to chase. Uh, but to the extent that I would pursue it at all, that's how I would think about it. And as I say, I've got a post on that very subject that I go into it in a little more coherent detail. I've posted it in the chat. Thank you. She's too good. She's too she good. Is. This is, the folks, this is how Chautauqua was run. It's just like <laughs> everything happens instantly and perfectly. So. <laughs> I preempt your needs, Jail. Uh, yeah, so we've got. I, that's one of the many reasons <laughs> I love you, Katie. <laughs> so we've got a question from Christopher. Uh, what advice do you have for those of us on the path but unsure of the why? FI is a goal of mine, but mostly to avoid a lousy retirement and lousy jobs. Any thoughts on how to explore this whilst working? Well, I think first of all, those are two good two good goals, right? I mean, to, to ensure your, your future retirement, no matter what age you choose to trigger that, and to allow you to step away from, uh, from crappy jobs. Uh, I guess my advice would, would be to do what I did, which is to take periodic sabbaticals. Uh, you know, if I, one of the things that I loved about having, again, I didn't have the concept of financial independence. I did have the concept of having FU money. Mm -hmm. which in my mind was not enough money to never work again, but it was enough money that I didn't have to worry about paying the rent, right? And so uh, I always wanted to have enough money that I could always step away from any job at any time for any reason or no reason. And I did that. That's, and that to me, that was freedom. That was power. Uh, that was more valuable than anything I could have bought with that money. Um, so I don't know if that's really an answer to, to his question, but that's, that's kind of how I think about it. And I also thinking about F you money in that sense where it's not enough that you never have to work again. Um, part of that is that every step you take in building your F you money makes you a little stronger. So yes. from the, from the very first dollar you invest, you're stronger than you were before you invested it. So I think a lot of people, what makes this path a little bit intimidating is they say, well, I'm at zero and you know, I need a million dollars, whatever the number is to, you know, to throw off the 4% the that I'm gonna need and blah, blah. That's just a, that's a huge journey. I, I mean, that's so discouraging. How do I even get there? And my response to that is, well, the destination is, is really the least of, you know, you'll get there. If you get on the path, you will get there. It's inevitable. But remember that from the very beginning of stepping on the path, you're a little bit stronger than you were the day before. I mean, it's just like lifting weights in the gym, right? 
you know, the first first time you go to lift weights, you're you're not going to lift very much. But well, you of course are the exception, Alan. But <laughs> but then the next time you go, you're a little stronger, and next time you're a little stronger after that, and you know, uh, yeah. So that's that's how I would think about it. I love that. I love that. Uh, so a couple of questions just on the book before we wrap up tonight. And if we haven't sure. got all of your questions, like we had a lot of them. So I've gone through as many as I can. On the book, Ryan says, for the Pathfinder stories, are the stories meant to have direct connection to the simple path to wealth? Um, or just the financial stories that are like along the path to wealth? So yeah, I think we're looking for connections to the simple path to wealth. So we remember this is a follow-up book to the simple path to wealth. So the idea is, you know, if if you uh, if you came across my blog and my stock series, or you read my book, The Simple Path to Wealth, and it resonated with you, and you said this is this is something that makes sense. This is something that I want to adopt. And it'll make my, my life better. Uh, but I'm not at the beginning of my journey, even if you are at the beginning of your journey, I guess. But, you know, how, how you adapted, uh, adapted the, the concepts that I present to your own unique situation. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess the simple answer is yes. We're looking for something that is, is how you adapted the, the concepts from the simple path to wealth to your situation, not just a financial journey, right? Love that. And Alex sort of asked a follow-up question. Why another book? What is what is this going to add to the world that you haven't already <laughs> said? I've, that's, that's not I've what added Alex it. said. He said, JL, why write another book? I added the second line. <laughs> you know, I... I uh, that's actually a more profound question than 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 maybe you guys realize because writing books for me is extraordinarily un, an extraordinarily unpleasant process. Uh, uh, Gloria Steinem, who was a very prolific author, was once asked uh, if she liked to write, and her response was, "I like having written," and. That just sums up how I feel about it entirely. I despise the process of writing. It is, it's hard drudgery, uh, but I love having written. I love having the ideas out there. And I, you know, uh, so that's what, what, what uh, keeps me going. Now this third book was, was kind of interesting along those lines because when Harriman first uh, reached out to me, and I first broached this idea that I had for this third book. Uh, I had been told that it was a terrible idea. And <laughs> so I kind of, by, by other people in the publishing community. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll throw this idea out. And these people will just go away and that'll be the end of that. So I was a little amazed when they came back and said, wow, we love this. We want to, we want to develop this. We have cool ideas on how to do it. So I was a little amazed and, we, it took, as I say, six months of conversation before we finally came to an agreement. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I'm a little bit surprised I'm doing a third book. So <laughs> if, if, yeah, if, if you guys are, are surprised that I'm doing it, you know, I uh, join the club. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, you, uh, blame it on my editor and Harriman, Chris, who, uh, who, uh, uh, turned out to be a delight to work with and, and came up with cool ideas and, and persuaded me that uh, this really is a great idea and, and uh, it'll be useful and well-received. And then the more I thought about it, the more excited I became about reading this, the stories and collating them and putting them together in a, in a, a coherent fashion that might be useful. So. I, from one, are very excited to read the book because I think those stories are the inspiration for what's possible for your own life. Right. And I think it's going to be incredibly inspiring for people because there's obviously the, the technical details of investing and then there's the stories about how it works in life and what life it creates and how you change things. And I, I, that's the 
the the oxygen the 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 food that gets you going and excited mm-hmm. about the future so i'm really looking forward to that yeah i am i i i am too i'm 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 very excited about it and and i have to i have to say if you had asked me 6 months ago if i was going to do another book i would have said are you out of your bloody mind <laughs> by british <laughs> I, I just i just finished i just finished this second book i'm never doing another book again <laughs> so nobody's more amazed that that uh, that i'm here than 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 i am uh question from uh, uh, i think it's abundant entropy is the name on youtube are you worried that the response to the book will be but yeah, all these people did well on the path to five because of the run in the stock market and the housing market for the last 10 years. So the short answer is no, I'm not worried about that at all. That is, you know, I, I do, you know, one of the things I have worried about because I started the blog in 2011 and the last few weeks notwithstanding, the market has pretty much done nothing but march up in a straight line. Uh, that's not what has enabled people to reach five. I mean, you can, you know, you can look at the numbers from the Trinity study and you can see that, you know, it was very doable in, in uh, past decades. What does worry me about that is that, uh, you know, you have a whole generation of people who've never experienced a bear market like we've just entered. And I'm worried that, and I always talk in, in detail in my book and in the blog, about how volatile the stock market is and how you have to be ready to endure this and you have to be prepared to wake up one day and find your portfolio is worth 40% less. But I'm not sure that people can take that to heart without living through it themselves. And maybe we're about to find that out. So I have a feeling that if we go into something you know, a bear market like what we're going through now is really nothing in my view. If this gets serious you know and by serious i mean 35 40 50 percent decline uh my guess is that a lot of people will will throw in the towel and say i'm done and then of course the market will turn around and march back up and they'll sit on the sidelines and be saying you know i'm it's just a casino because they didn't really understand what they were doing and and how to play the game so i i worry about it from that point of view uh but you know, there's only so much I could do. All I could do is explain what the simple path approach is and how the volatility of the market plays into that and how you need to expect that that is going to happen and understand it's a natural part of the process. And as we talked about earlier, a, a wonderful opportunity, actually, um, if, you're, if you're building wealth. So we're wrapping up for this event. We've been going for 77 minutes, which has felt like a split second to me. Um, to me thank- as well. Yes, yeah, too much fun. Oh, it distracts for me. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't really enjoy it. Yeah, well, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> So if we haven't got to your question, uh, apologies for that. Like it, the time flew, we answer as many as we can and we'll put another one of these on in the future. We are planning another one together, which will be fun. And hopefully we'll get Mille- Millennial Revolution to come and join us as well and hang out. Yeah. Um, you'll find the link to Pathfinders, the new book for JL, in the description. Uh, please click on that, put in your details, fill it out. Even if you don't have a story, they'll tell you about the book and what's happening and they might well inspire you to get involved from there. And so yeah, that's, a, that's a great point. Even if you don't want to contribute a story, you know, uh, sign up. If you're at all interested in the book, sign up and then you'll, you'll, uh, uh, you'll be kept informed as it comes together over the next year. And any of the articles we mentioned, I'm going to put in the description for the video as well so that people are catching up can find those links as well. Absolutely. And to everyone who's been watching, thank you for watching. There's some of our favourite people are hanging out. Jason Dangler here is, is here. Christina's here. There's so many people that are here. So thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, thank you being, for the great questions. They were uh, awesome questions today. So. Yes. Really thought-provoking, which I love. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, when you 
working along your path to FI, we'll see you at one of the Chautauqua events or we'll meet you somewhere around the world at one of these events in the future. And the whole point of this community is to hang out. And uh, one of your favourite lines, JL, which I've kind of stolen and added to is having cool conversations with cool people in cool locations with cool food. That is a big thing that you and Katie have added is... <laughs> Is is the great food? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Food's important. It is, it is important, and, and it, it's been awesome. Uh, yes. Any last messages for everyone watching before we wrap up? Oh, I think I think you just covered it well. I, I I'm not sure I can add any anything that you haven't just said. So I'll I'll let it I'll let it stop there. Perfect. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thank you for coming. We'll see you soon somewhere around the world. Thanks, everybody. It's been it's been a blast.